This episode has what we've all been waiting for, following up on the last episode's exciting finish, the big show of the area where you can cash out. Before this show, they spent hours drilling and looking for artifacts and clues. Many people are on the edge of their seats. What are you going to find? Will there be a treasure hidden there? Or will the tunnel be too dangerous to explore? Wait until the end of the movie to see what Oak Island's team has been waiting for a long time. At the beginning of the show, the team's excitement and anticipation are clear. Anyone who wants to work is eager to do so the operation can begin. Everyone is interested in what will be found. It is planned by the team that cameras will be put down the boreholes so they can see clearly what is below. Blaine Carr, an expert in underwater imaging, was asked to help lead the team to the big find they were hoping to make. This is different from other processes because of the depth of the borehole and the thing that is being targeted. The digging team's first job of the day is to check out Aladdin's cave, which is about 140 to 142 feet deep, to see what's going on there. Among other things, the team hopes to find treasures, learn about the cave's history and what its design points show, and most importantly, find the entrance and exit points. Interestingly, all the questions and hopes don't seem too far-fetched based on what Idean Technologies has said. In fact, all of them seem very doable if you are patient and pay close attention. The earlier observations and data collection have given us a lot of information about what to expect and where to look for areas with a lot of anomalies. The new story is interesting because it adds a little something new to the treasure hunt. Based on the information gathered, it looks like there are more than one place where riches might be hidden. The drilling crew chose to put a camera in the L-14 hole first, which is at the southern end of Aladdin's cave. The first thing that had to be done was to carefully open the hole and drop the high-definition camera deep into it. This is to find out exactly where it is and to prove where it came from by looking at its structure. After the operation, which should go well, Blaine will do the operation for which he was hired, a sonar scan to make a map of the underground plan and features. Blaine Carr, an expert in underwater imaging, carefully put the camera down the borehole while the lights were on. The camera was tied to some kind of rope. As soon as the camera starts to move down below, it can be seen that the void is full of water with some metal in it. The team thinks they will be able to do a 3D sonar scan soon. This is possible, but they see something that makes them unsure. The pictures from the camera show some kind of thing deep below, and the team keeps lowering it to get a better look at what it could be. After a while of slowly lowering the drill bit, the team stopped to look at the side of the hole, which turned out to be the edge of the case. To find out more, the camera was turned around so that the feature could be seen from all sides. That same day, the cave's teeth were found. When the camera was lowered another foot, the picture from the camera showed the cave's opening. Further into the cave, the sides, walls, and slope could be seen. But something else seemed to be missing or out of sight. The camera was lowered another three inches because Marty wanted to look around the edge of the ledge more. More into the ledge, there was a much bigger hole that looked like a tunnel or a good. To get to the very bottom of the cave, the camera was lowered even more. It was about six inches deeper when it found a very large hole. The camera was slowly turned around 360 degrees to look at what was around that hole. The picture showed some medium-sized dirt bumps that looked like they had something under them. But it was hard to tell if these bumps were on the cave side or at the bottom. A lump that looked harder than the others could be seen at the right angle. It looked like a broken rock with sharp edges. The rock was flat on top and had a shape that looked like it was hiding something, which could be the buried treasure. Right now, there is no chance of finding anything else until more data has been looked at. The research team chose to move forward by getting a scan of the cave's opening at the interpretive center. There was already a new project going on, and the magnetic analysis report was ready after St. Mary's University processed the data. It looks like the archaeologists on the team knew more about the artifacts that had already been found and the magnetometry study of the roundstone features in Lot 5. A lot of people are looking forward to the reports because Lot 5 has given them a lot of artifacts and files that connect to the money put area. The cave's walls, stone features, and empty spaces that have been looked into with a camera are some of the things that are expected to be found. According to the report, a picture that looked like lumps of cement was found on magnetic susceptibility. It is an oval shape that, when turned on its side, 
looks like a big hole. There are also big holes in the ground around this area that point to a stone feature that is surprisingly bigger than the big feature itself and is hidden below it. There is no doubt that the team is confused and open to new ideas after the results of the data analysis. This means that there is more to look into than was thought. At first, the team was interested in the round feature. Now they're more worried about what's bigger and lies below it. Is it some kind of seal for a tunnel or prize chest? Or does it hold things that are much older than the island or the discovery? Jamie, an archaeologist, says that the bigger construction is not a coincidence and is not the result of natural events. It looked so well put together and planned that it must have been made by someone with a lot of time to get it just right. People who lived on the island before could have done it, or it could have been the work of searchers or crazier ideas abound, the military that once held the island. It's interesting to note that the dates of building for both structures seem to be different. This means that there's a good chance that one existed before the order and may have been used as a model for the other. It looks like the only way to get more information is to know when the building will be done. Once that is taken care of, it might be possible to find out more about the society that lived there and where the people who lived on the island before them came from. The team has an idea that the structure may not have been built by just one generation, but was instead improved over time to better serve its purpose until it was worn down by natural causes or being abandoned. Even though the result wasn't great, it shows that the team is very likely on the right track to solving the puzzle of the island. After the next morning, the team goes back to the garden shaft operation to see what changes have been made and if there have been any new finds since it was drilled deeper. The Dumas building team then put together the shoe, which was made of a metal frame and was meant to protect them from the ground while they explored the area below the surface. To do this, you just need to dig under the shoe and add another section to it to make a part of the shoe. You will also need to add five piles of shoes to make the structure. At the bottom of the garden shaft, which is about 82 feet deep, Dumas construction put the shoe in place. The next step is to extend the shaft through the shoe to a depth of more than 95 feet. Once this is done, it can be used as a way to get to the tunnel and other drilled holes that lead to the baby blob, which is where the prize jackpot is. It's not a surprise that fixing the first shoe and pushing it to the bottom of the garden shaft is not easy. It will probably take a couple of hours before it can be finished. Another part of the team, the archaeologists, have also started digging again on Lot 5 and have been working their way through the round stone hollow. It looks like even more work has been made since the last report. From what has been seen on the magnetometer data, it looks like the round feature has a big rectangular feature under it, as shown in the pictures at the Interpretation Center. This has been proven on Lot 5, and it looks like the archaeologist team was able to find out more. They think that the area with moving water is around the outside of the stone wall and goes all the way around the hollow in the shape of a circle. However, the full width of it won't be known until more digging is done. The current objective is to find out the size of the rectangular feature without forcing through any possible artifacts. This is because forcing through is the faster and easier option, but there is a greater than 99% chance of damaging the object beyond repair. Most of the artifacts that are being found are broken pieces of creamware. It looks like putting the bits together might be enough to make the whole ship. As the team carefully sorts through the dirt and rocks, they hope to find more signs that will help them learn more about the circular depression and what it is supposed to be. During the sorting, Jack finds something else. This time, there are no creamware parts. The team all says that it looks a lot like a handmade square fastener with spikes that look like rose heads and maybe from the 1700s. Jamie said an interesting fact about irons that was made at a time when they corroded outwards instead of inwards, which deepened them. The iron was more worn on the outside than on the inside, which means it was made a long time before the island was found, possibly even a hundred years before it was found. Their idea seems to fit with the past of the rose spikes, they are commonly made by hand with hammers that have rose-shaped petal heads, and the spikes are used to build houses and big ships, which gives us two possible histories for the circular depression. The spike might have been a part of a building tool that was left behind after the project was finished, or it could have been a product that a sailor brought to the island to use for himself, maybe to build a house or tunnel. Good thing there's a way to compare the spike to other spikes that have been found on the island so far. The spike was put in a bag 
so that it could be seen and studied by the CT machine. Not long after the spike was found, another metal was also found. The team thinks it's a handle, maybe for a tool, because it's long, thin, light, and has an oddly shaped head. These two finds seem to point to the first people who lived on the island and the people who built the money pit. It's way too late for these finds to be used by hunters as tools. It either belonged to native people or people who hid wealth there. Blaine Carr, an expert, is still working in the money pit area. He is using a sonar device to scan the Aladdin cave and record information about its properties, features, and measures. He is also looking into any tunnels that are close to the cave. To start the job, the Echologger DAS 710 scanning device was carefully put through the hole. Sound, walls, sides, the bottom, or any other angle can be reflected by this gadget. The items make a three-dimensional map of the water below when they are reflected. At 140 feet, the team chose to see what the Sonata gadget would do. The experts think that the information on the screen shows the shape of the cavity's edge. In the beginning, most of what is being perceived comes from sound reflections. The team chose to leave the device for a long time, until the next morning, so that visible data could be gathered. Another member of the Oak Islands team traveled quite a way to meet with Jeff Parker, a famous weapons expert, at Nova Tactical. The goal is to learn more about the weapons that were found during excavations on Lot 5 of the island. Based on what the archaeologists thought, it could be a ramrod guide, and the weapons expert agreed that this was the case. The ramrod guide was used on muskets and smaller guns like flip-lock pistols. The experts think that this ramrod, because of its size and shape, would have been used for smaller guns. Something like this might have been part of a hunter's gun tool. Does it have a more interesting history? When the old Roman number was brought up, Jeff seemed a little surprised at how unlikely it was that such an old weapon would be found. He said he had never handled something so old, and it was possible that it was from much earlier than the 1700s, maybe even the 16th century, which was a long time before the money pit was found. There is no question that the team's theory was not too far-fetched, and they are very close to figuring out what happened. The next morning is a little different because the weather has changed, but it looks like nothing is stopping the team from stopping their work. The team got together under a shed to look at the long-awaited video data from Echologger DAS 710, which is 200 feet down in Aladdin's cave. According to Blaine Carr, the report is a flat-faced wall surface that shows it was built by people and not by nature's actions and soil disturbances. It was carved out and there is a hole right at the cave's entry. This usually means that there is a way to get out of the cave, but no exit was seen. This story seems normal when compared to other holes that have been found and are full of sand, debris, and muddy water. Blaine needs to make more observations before he can come to a decision. Parts of the artifacts found at Lot 5 were taken to the Interpretive Center to be studied, and the results are now ready. As usual, Emma Culligan used the Skyscan 1273 CT scanner and the X-ray fluorescence spectrometer to figure out what kind of metals were found, what their qualities were, and when they were most likely made. The rose spikes were the first thing that was scanned. It shows that they used to have two holes at the head and at each end. The only thing that could be found in it was iron, with no signs of modern qualities. It also has a high ratio of aluminium to silicone, which is typical of English tools and artifacts from the 1600s to 1700s. Emma also confirmed that the tool was similar to other items that had been found to belong to Sir William Phipp, who was the main treasure hunter on Oak Island. This report reveals that the team made a big discovery, which can be seen in their happy and impressed faces. Emma said that the properties and features looked a lot alike and that it was very unlikely that it belonged to someone else. These findings show that the feature under the round hollow was made by people who dug the caves and tunnels in the first place. A few years ago, the team met with Freemason Scott Clark, who brought up the idea that Sir William Phipp might have a link to Oak Island. A Freemason said that a politician found the Spanish wealth galleon Conception off the coast of East Dominica in 1641. It looks like waves and other natural events brought most of the jewels, cash, and weapons to Oak Island but Phipp was also able to find about 36 tons of gold, jewelry, and arms during his finding. Andrew Belcher, a Freemason with ties to Mahoma Bay, which is close to Oak Island, went with Phipp on his second trip to recover the ship. 
It's possible that not all of the riches were brought back to England. Instead, they may have been kept on the island where no one lived, so no one would have known about their exploits. Is it possible that Phipps never got back the pieces he had hidden for himself or when told to by a high-level official? The square fastener was also looked at, and the uneven shapes and curving edges on its sides proved that it was made by hand. The fact that it doesn't have any modern metallurgy also shows that it is old. Like the first analysis, it has a high aluminium to silicone ratio, which makes it very likely that it has something to do with Sir William Phil's missing treasures. Would it be a coincidence, or do there really exist a connection between the high metal level found in some places and the silvers that were lost on the Spanish conception wreckage? One thing that is clear is that Lot 5 has more to offer than what has been found. What was the starting point for the buried riches? Or did different people want the treasures in different places, causing them to be split up? As the scientists on the team carefully dig in several depressions on Lot 5, it looks like the answer is buried below the ground. Lot 5 seems to reveal a mystery that has been kept secret. But what is it? The next morning, the team meets with Blaine Carr in the war room to work on his report about Aladdin's cave. The team was shown a 3D picture, and he thinks that the yellow-green area is going downhill, while the darker red area is the wall and shows how far down the cave goes from the ground. Sad to say, the sonar scanner didn't find any records on the cave's floor, which is the most important part of the report in this case. Blaine said that this is because the wall is in the way of the camera's view and casts some shade on it. He does confirm, though, that there is a gap between the two blue lines, which means it could be an entry or exit. This interesting fact made the team feel good that their hard work was finally paying off, and they kept looking for the exit of the carbon. It's possible that the exit is blocked because of natural or man-made changes to the earth, but that doesn't mean it won't be cleared of dirt and debris when it's found. Blaine is sure that the cavern, also known as Aladdin's Cave, was built by humans at first, but it's possible that it has become more natural over time since people haven't been there much in a long time. When asked about the size of the hole, Blaine said that the structure of the cave doesn't give a clear answer because it slopes 30 degrees, which is also why the sonar couldn't see the cave's bottom. He does say, though, that gravity makes it very likely that the wealth is at the bottom and that there may be other artifacts hidden there as well. He says that a five-foot hole should be drilled in the other part of the cave to get to the bottom. This way might make it possible for the sonar scanner to see the bottom. At the end of the meeting, everyone agrees that Blaine should drill another hole to learn more about Aladdin's cave and get more information before digging can start. If you like what you see so far, subscribe to the channel. Without a doubt, this week brought the team even closer to solving the puzzle of the island. A lot of the work that has been done has helped find the lost riches. It looks like the next step will bring us even closer to finding the prize. The search goes on, and the treasure is still out there, maybe even in the next show.